which investor asks teachers how they rate managers. To be exact, I was asking about the qualities of a great entrepreneur. Teachers said they like managers who are passionate about business. Ask yourself when you buy a company, whether they love money or business. It's not wrong for a manager to love money. However, there is a possibility that you will not run the company in just a few years. The difference between people who start a company is that it's passion with a company that's run by someone who just comes in the middle, sells the company for a few years and leaves. The subsidiaries of Berkshire Hathaway know that they belong to Berkshire Hathaway, but I love that they consider their company to be theirs. There was a time when an investment bank came to resell a company that they bought just a few years ago and they're likely to try to massage the numbers in some way and sell them off. Such a company is a target to be thrown away, but if that's right, what would I do even if I bought it? If our judgment of managerial enthusiasm is correct, they will continue to lead their business even if the bank has a lot of money. They love their business. I don't care what the world thinks of Berkshire Hathaway. If I look at Berkshire Hathaway and it feels okay, nothing will change. This is what I do every day. It's not about the price of a stock, it's about how the company is doing. And we have managers who have this perspective. I think it's very interesting to think about which is more important, passion or natural ability. I think passion is more important than intellectual ability. If we had passion, if we didn't have the ability, we wouldn't have been able to invest, and if we didn't have the ability, we would have already disappeared. I've seen a lot of companies that are dominated by money-playing capitalists. When they come in, it's obvious that they want to increase loans as much as possible, play accounting, and eventually sell them. What's interesting is that those companies are often taken over by another money game. Thinking you could play the same game twice. Let me give you a supplementary explanation about what the teachers said. Teachers seem to be in a position that there is no need to discuss superiority and inferiority about ability and passion. Because I saw that ability is a must, and you think that the keyword passion is an important quality of a manager. In other words, passion can be said in other words how much you love the business you run. I'd like to introduce you to Mrs. Rose Blumkin, the owner of a small furniture store that has now become a Nebraska furniture store. She was a poor immigrant and illiterate who could not read and write English until the moment she died at the age of 100. However, she stood out as a 1.2 trillion one businesswoman faithful to keeping the basics of her business. What was the basis of the business that led her to become a great manager who was illiterate? The teacher said they meant the basics of the business to please customers and provide them with a good experience. I thought about how to measure the subjective thing of passion. It seems to end up in the word attitude. Well, continue. An investor asked about the risk perspective. Teachers always assume the worst, so they set a big safety margin. The 100th case came with a 1% chance of bankruptcy, although others might think it's stupid. He said it's meaningless for teachers. If you're trying to measure risk in a mathematical way, it's a really dangerous behavior. Armed with various degrees and high-level mathematics, smart people tend to fit problems into answers. 
you would have known how ridiculous everything about stock prices going up 10 times a day and getting margin calls was. Let me give you a supplementary explanation of the risks. To sum up teachers' words, you should be wary of believing mathematical calculations such as standard errors because unexpected things always happen. I think I can sum it up to that. As Professor Earthworth de Moderan said, we should not affirm the risk because of the outlier of phenomenon. According to Professor de Moderan's other expression, all results are probabilistic, not conclusive. I think I can understand more deeply through Howard and Mayorek's book on investment as a book that deeply researches the aspect of volatility about risk. Well, continue. An investor asks teachers that when they make a new investment, they seem to buy between 5 and 10% of their portfolio. Teachers said it wasn't like that, but sometimes it's because it's a small company, so I couldn't put in a lot of money, and it might look like that because I'm reducing my position. I like to go into big events that I'm very confident about. So it boils down to the question of decentralization, which I don't think usually works for people who don't know what they're doing. Dispersion is essentially a defense against ignorance. Dispersion isn't necessarily bad if you don't want something worse to happen than the market, so you have all the stocks. Or put some great companies in, but it doesn't make sense to put money back in 30 or 35 before I even put more money in stock number one. It's kind of a practice and if what you're trying to achieve is just average, you can do that, but in our view, it's kind of a confession. It's a confession that I don't understand the company I own properly. I have only one stock in my personal portfolio. I feel very comfortable because I know the company well. So it just doesn't make sense to have 28 stocks for proper variance. I like the fact that I can find more than three stocks and incorporate more, but three great companies are enough to make a very good investment career. If you look at how wealth builds up in this country, you don't build a portfolio of 50 companies. He who finds a good company is the one who builds wealth. Coca-Cola is a good example. There can't be 50 companies like Coca-Cola. It can't be 20. If you have a really good company and you can survive all the ups and downs of the years. And those three companies would be better than the 100 average companies if they could withstand competition well. Having three good, easily identifiable companies is less risky than having 50 well-known large companies. What I can tell you for sure is that if I have to invest my entire familiar's assets over the next 30 years, it will choose three stocks we have rather than a group that's divided into 50 stocks. In particular, the modern portfolio theory taught in modern corporate finance lectures is not particularly useful. It will teach you how to be average, but I think even young students can do that. It looks complicated, but it's not that difficult. You see a lot of little Greek letters and these things make you feel like you're in some great league, but it's not really worth it. We'll give you a supplementary explanation. It seems that teachers are basically very negative about the various theories advocated by the professors of the ivory tower. In particular, I am extremely reluctant to theories such as random work represented by a market efficiency theory. Although the market is generally effectively priced, Sometimes distortion occurs due to factors like human psychology because the ivory tower professors tend to dismiss it as being reflected in the market price as well. And because we measure it in various difficult ways, it feels like we know everything in itself. 
As Professor Earthworth de Moderen said, this is especially evident in quantitative analysis, commonly referred to as number crunches, just as he believes that if you count all the stars in the sky in the novel Little Prince, you will have them. I do. Regarding Professor Earthworth de Moderen's book, which deals with distributed investment in depth, I uploaded a video on three books published in Korea in the book reading category, so it would be good to refer to it. Well, continue. An investor told you that Warren Buffett, who was following Ben Graham's investment approach, learned an important lesson from the acquisition of Siskandi to buy a good company. In what ways did you realize that the idea of buying a good company was a better strategy for long-term investment? The teacher said that it was stupid enough that if Siskandi called for $100,000 more at the time of the acquisition, there would have been no deal. Marshall, who ran Siskandi at the time of the transaction, said that the premium for the quality of the business should also be included in the price. I told my teachers that I was underestimating the quality of the business. The teachers said they were able to go further by listening to Marshall and accepting him constructively. After all, you found that buying a great company at an affordable price is better than buying a great company at an affordable price. The investment method does not change at a certain point, but even if you accept an important idea, the previous idea does not disappear, but it comes in and out of both boundaries. In other words, there was not a very clear line between tobacco investment and great corporate investment. The teachers turned to great corporate investment, but sometimes they decided to return to cigarette butts. Let me add that teachers do not seem to have a particular view of investment based on certain unchanging truths, but rather to be flexible in choosing the right way for each case. I think you're adding it to your investment perspective by maximizing the advantages after identifying the advantages and disadvantages of the investment method. Like Charlie Munger's famous grid model thinking system, he seems to continue to develop a dense honeycomb grid model thinking system by sublimating knowledge across all directions into wisdom. Well, continue. An investor asked if the market capitalization to gross domestic product and the ratio of economic adjustment cycle return are still valid indicators when calculating market value. Teachers said that one indicator of securities valuation is not more important than the other. People always try to find a formula, and even if there's an ultimate formula, the problem is that they don't know what variables to put into that formula. In some cases, even if you adopt an economic adjustment method or a different method in calculating the share price earnings ratio, each has its own meaning, and sometimes some figures are more meaningful than others. A company's valuation can be simplified by just putting a variable in one formula. It is not just that one or two of the formulas are overvalued or undervalued. To give my personal opinion in the middle, when asked about the validity of individual indicators, teachers seem to advise that there cannot be indicators like cheek and that various indicators should be viewed. As Professor Earthworth de Moderen said, depending on the lifestyle of the company, there are items that should be considered important at each time. It seems necessary to cross-check various indicators and pay attention to indicators that are important to each situation. After that, teachers tell extra stories to investors who want to do well in corporate valuation. The first rule of fishing is to fish where there is fish. If fishing is the stock market, a good angler told me to invest in places where there are many opportunities. 
Finally, if you really want to learn, there's definitely nothing like the experience of learning from pain and you're going to learn a lot more about business if you struggle in a terrible situation. I also learned a lot from the period of trade disputes between the United States and China, including China's retaliation against Thaad, continuing to face global quarantine issues and vividly experiencing a sharp rate hike. It's not fun to go through bad conditions one after another, but I think experiencing a lot of volatility in it will be of great help to my investment life in the future.